welcome to this uh, panel, expert panel on the strategies for monetizing embedded finance. So this really sets the stage for what it is, a uh, full day of conferences under the theme embedded finance and open finance. And I am uh, happy to be moderating this panel along with this esteemed uh, group of uh, uh, experts. So uh, I'm going to uh, introduce each one of you. I have uh, next to me, Jill McDonald, Chief Operating Officer from Walnut Insurance. Thank you for being here with Thank us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hannah Melton, uh, Head of Banking and Expansion for WISE in North America. Thank you for being here, Hannah. Andrew Moore, Chief Operating Officer, President of Equitable Bank and EQ Bank. Pleased to be here. And Mathieu Stanulis, VP Product, Digital Platforms, uh, and Chief Transformation Officer of Retail at the Desjardins uh, Group. Thank you for being here with us. Bonjour. So uh, thanks everyone. Like we would like to start like by setting the stage. As we know, uh, embedded finance in Canada is increasingly seen as the integration of financial services into non-financial uh, platforms. And each of uh, each of our guests have really been uh, successfully implementing different uh, strategies uh, into their business models. So we would like to start off by hearing some of the perspectives on what is embedded finance, how this has been played out and being successfully integrated in each one of your organizations. And uh, one of the use cases that was one of the first uh, it's in payments, so maybe, Anna, I would like uh, to start uh, by uh, you. Um, so, let me... Pages. Um, can you tell us more about the role of uh, international money transfers, the role of WISE, and share insights on how embedded finance has impacted uh, the business model and the competitive positioning of WISE uh, in the international remittance uh, landscape. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with WISE, we are a global technology company that is building the best way to move and manage the world's money. And our mission is to make cross-border payments instant, transparent, convenient, and affordable. And we've been building an infrastructure for international payments for the last 13 years. In that time, we've only seen demand for a better experience in international payments increase. And this is really due to the trends that we see in peer-to-peer -peer payments, consumer payments. If I can easily pay my friend back for brunch instantly via a mobile wallet, why can't I, in a small business setting, instantly pay a provider in the Philippines? Um, but as we looked at the industry, we realized we were not the only ones trying to solve this really challenging problem for our users. There were banks, other FIs, other large organizations that were similarly trying to improve the, this experience for their own customers. So we saw this as a great opportunity to, for growth to create an opportunity to bring our infrastructure to larger organizations. And that's why we built WISE Platform, which is our embedded finance solution. WISE Platform allows us to bring our payments infrastructure to larger enterprise clients, and we enable them to empower their end users to send international payments, making them faster, um, more convenient, and they're able to make these payments at the middle market exchange rate with more transparency into what fees they're paying. I'm actually super excited to be on stage with Andrew from EQ Bank. Um, they're one of our great partners at Wise Platform, and I understand that we have kind of a fun meet cute that's relevant to this meeting, right? Well, I think, I think we first met here in, back in 2019 and, and, and stood up a partnership with Wise back in 2019. So I think from the time we met to the time we were actually going live was about four months. So it kind of indicates when you've got somebody with broad capability how you can embed that into the platform, into our platform, and then immediately uh, bring it to life. And I remember doing a live uh, town hall with our employees soon after we went live, where one of our, one of our employees was, uh, was, uh, had a bank account in India, and we were able to show moving money on Wise's rails from our bank account in Canada to India in 30 seconds. And when you think about that in Canada, it actually takes you longer on domestic rails, yeah. that we could move money that fast within, within a, from our, domestic, from our, our platform. Um, but just going back to why we even integrate with WISE, though, or why we did that, you know, we set up a digital bank, uh, Banque Q, uh, back in 2016. And we, we have a kind of 
we got lots of capability in deposits, um, many kinds of things for the domestic market. We're not going to be busy trying to build an international capability. For us, the monetization of um, embedded, fi embedded finance is mostly about making our product more attractive to our customers so that, and attracting more customers and driving down the cost of acquisition. So to the extent we've got WISE as another feature of our product and, and other embedded finance solutions for that matter, it drives down the cost of acquisitions that can add to our deposit base that then adds to the scale of the bank where we use those funds elsewhere. So I think there's many ways to think about how we would, you know, for many fintechs, you'd be wanting to monetize uh, your product by some sort of fee revenue. For us, having the deposit sitting inside the bank is valuable in and of itself, uh, and not, so ne not necessarily the, a fee-for-service type model. Mm, exactly, and that was a huge opportunity of growth for us to then also broaden our servicing of the Canadian market, which is incredibly diverse. 15% of Canadians last year sent a cross-border payment, and most of those will be repeat users. So we're super excited to be partners and continue to grow and scale together. Yeah, so, so on this, uh, continuing on, on this uh, partnership, so Andrew, uh, if you can tell us as well, um, there is a focus of EQ Bank in becoming a challenger bank in Canada. So how does embedded finance and, and these opportunities, uh, maybe other use cases as well, other than, than with WISE, how does this uh, help you in this uh, strategy? For I think it allows us to really focus on our, our core. So what, what can we, re we, we can be really good at, and then partner with people that can be really good at other things and then recognize that you know, we're not going to be great at everything I and mean, we really want to ha offer a fantastic customer experience, great onboarding, a great app, the ability to open up multiple accounts easily so you can set up savings goals, all kinds of features that we want to build in our app and then but, and not limit our customers though to not having services that other, others can provide better. So for example, if somebody's actually looking for a mortgage inside the app, we'll, get, we'll route them into Nesto for a digital mortgage, mortgage experience. So it's another example of adding value to our customers without us actually have to be great at digital mortgages. And so there's a whole range of products that over time we would expect to enable. And we're really hopeful that open banking and the real-time rail as well will open up other, other services for us so that we can, in many cases, in order to, to have the embedded finance solution, you actually need more data. And, and clearly in Canada, without open banking, we're a bit limited on some of the data we'd have to offer that, open, that uh, embedded finance solution. Thank you. So when we speak about embedded finance, we often include embedded <laughs> insurance, but they, but so now I would like to change maybe, uh, Jill, uh, if you can provide a perspective, you know, Walnut is, uh, has a focus on technology and embedded insurance model, and how is this, how is this model reshaping uh, the, uh, the customer experience uh, and, uh, and integrating all of this into the new uh, trends that we're seeing. Yeah, thanks Edith, and I'm so glad that we're talking about insurance alongside finance. I think when you think about monetization opportunities, it is another product and solution that can go hand in hand with many of the experiences. But I'll step back for a second around who is Walnut in the event that anyone hasn't heard us. So we love to be behind the scenes, so we may be present, but you don't even know we're there. Um, we're one of Canada's leading insure techs. For us, we really empower and enable partners to be able to stand up net new insurance lines or or augment what they're doing or optimize the way you're working with carriers today. We do that by creating these partner-led experiences and enabling consumers to access insurance the moment they're already engaging with you on your journey. We do that whether it's through SMS, through your app experience, through email, through accessing a home mortgage, the ability to actually see complementary insurance products alongside the way you're already engaging with your consumer is something that we really love to do. I think we're the only Canadian um, insurance company with publicly available APIs. You can always go and look and understand how we're operating. Um, but for us, we really wanna make sure that the consumer has the ability to access insurance at the moment that they need. We use permission data and of course, content is always there, but we work with partners to share that information so you can offer insurance at that time of need. Maybe I'll talk an example, and, and Andrew just mentioned mortgages, um, not only with your partner Nesto, but we've got similar partnerships there with Pineapple and others where you know insurance is a required element to actually close on that loan. It's an element that the consumer needs to produce in order to make sure that that transaction closes. And so for us, it's very much on how do we work with that partner to satisfy that customer need, and how at that moment that they're actually provided with that loan detail, and the 
kind of checklist in terms of what they need to complete, you're actually able to offer them insurance-based quotes across multi-carrier opportunities. So it feels as though they shop the market, but you're providing that inside of that partner experience, branded as that partner and the way that they're already engaging. So there's different ways that you can look about it and understand. And for us, I think creditor, which is a big piece of our market, many of the financial institutions and even challenger banks start to offer creditor-based insurance across any debt. What we're trying to do is modernize that. How do you create those single-click opportunities that are embedded the moment you're actually securing your loan? And so it creates the opportunity for the consumer not to retell their story, but they're actually just continuing that process. They're not having to step out at any point, but they're actually gaining coverage while they're securing their debt and really looking at different ways to modernize that. And we do that with some partners, FIG and Fora and others. Um, and I'd say there's just different ways to be thinking about embedded insurance, even in the non-traditional markets. I think we're starting to see quite a bit in telcos, utilities, challenger banks, neobanks really leaning into this space. There's, of course, a little bit less regulation there, but you're starting to see them offer tenant-based insurance or other home protection and warranty products alongside what they're offering today, all embedded in the way that they're already engaging their consumer with a whole goal to increase stickiness in enhance monetization and create the higher level of revenue per user. Yeah, so I like that you're saying all embedded, embedded insurance, embedded finance, which uh, kind of leads also to what is like the embedded experience. And on that, uh, uh, Mathieu and uh, we can switch, on peut faire un peu en français, en anglais, uh, c'est pas un problème. Um, essentially, uh, comment est-ce que Desjardins approche cette notion d'expérience intégrée euh, pour les coopératives ou autres institutions comme Desjardins, qu'est-ce que euh, vous êtes en train de faire pour améliorer cette expérience puis ajouter ces, des produits euh, qui, euh, que les membres peuvent utiliser? Alors, ben, merci pour l'invitation. Euh, D'ailleurs, euh, est euh, on est très heureux, je pense, tout le monde de venir partager un peu notre expérience. Puis la question est vraiment intéressante sur l'expérience qu'on veut offrir à, à nos membres. Puis je, là, je peux parler pour Desjardins, mais pour les, les, les Credit Union en général, on est dans un modèle coopératif, une association de personnes qui veut se donner des services. Donc, au-delà de vendre ou proposer des produits et services, on veut créer des expériences. Et les expériences, euh, quand on le regarde avec la lunette du consommateur, l'expérience ne commence pas quand les gens viennent visiter notre site. Elles commencent dans leur vie avec leurs projets, leurs événements de vie. Donc, comment réussir à bâtir des écosystèmes? Là, là on parle de finances intégrées, mais dans le fond, on parle d'écosystèmes où les gens vont, vont commencer une expérience de magasinage ou auront à répondre à leurs besoins dans des, dans des, avec, euh, avec différentes interactions, avec différentes compagnies, différents sites. Alors, euh, nous, une des, une des stratégies qu'on a chez Desjardins, c'est qu'on réalise bien qu'on euh, est quand même dans un marché canadien où le, la littératie financière est relativement faible. Donc, on, on prend pour hypothèse que plus on va offrir des solutions de paiement ou de crédit en un clic, euh, plus on va offrir euh, des facilités d'avoir accès aux produits financiers, il faut en même temps augmenter la littératie financière de la population. Donc, on a différentes stratégies dans des écosystèmes qui ne sont pas nécessairement chez Desjardins pour aller à, améliorer la littératie. On peut penser à la caisse scolaire. Peut-être certains d'entre vous, les Montréalais dans la salle, euh, les Québécois dans la salle, euh, avaient vécu quand on était jeunes euh, la, le concept de caisse scolaire. On mettait des sous dans une enveloppe à l'école. On l'a repensé en 2024, on vient de lancer une application mobile pour faire essentiellement la même chose. Pas des sous dans une enveloppe, mais éduquer les jeunes avec le parent sur, sur, la, sur, la, sur la finance. On a aussi lancé un jeu Aléa qui, euh, qui, qui s'adresse aux adolescents pour apprendre euh, à développer des habitudes de, de gestion budgétaire. Donc, des choses qui ne sont pas nécessairement sous la marque des jardins, mais où on pense qu'on a un rôle à jouer dans, dans la société. Puis évidemment, l'écosystème que vous avez beaucoup entendu parler de Desjardins dans les dernières années, on bâtit un écosystème autour de l'habitation, donc une expérience d'habitation qui n'est pas juste de proposer un prêt hypothécaire, l'expérience habitation, ça commence par un rêve d'avoir une maison. Donc, on a intégré dans notre écosystème euh, ce qu'on appelle l'espace proprio, l'espace proprio qui est euh, à la fois euh, pour, euh, pour euh, magasiner une maison de façon autonome avec l'acquisition qu'on a fait de du proprio. Euh, on a aussi euh, lancé les services Confia où on s'associe avec des courtiers immobiliers pour référer nos membres à des courtiers immobiliers euh, qui sont euh, qui sont liés à des jardins pour, pour, pour l'achat de propriétés en mode accompagné. 
Et on a également aussi lancé, euh, acheté euh, et lancé Reno Assistance, une solution qui permet à nos, à nos utilisateurs d'avoir accès à un bassin d'entrepreneurs certifiés pour faire des rénovations à la maison. Et donc, on a évidemment aussi nos produits hypothécaires, nos produits d'assurance euh, d'assurance maison. Donc, vraiment un écosystème complet sur l'expérience habitation où on intègre tout ce, tous ces morceaux-là ensemble. Oh, that's uh, super interesting. And uh, this, uh, this kind of leads me to ask you questions around, well, All, with all these use cases, what are your challenges? What is it that you have been facing? And so uh, if we start off with uh, jail and insurance, um, what are the regulatory challenges that you have been facing? In, uh, and how are you navigating these regulatory uh, challenges when partnering with uh, all of these uh, fintechs and insurtechs? And I and think, traditional banks. Yeah, thank you. I think that we all know uh, finance and insurance are some of the more highly regulated sectors in the globe. I think for us, compliance and regulatory are always the first conversation we're having with partners, specifically in the financial institution realm. And we were even talking backstage, actually, as it relates to, there's many, of course, that are subject to the Bank Act regulations, but then depending on, and even from a Desjardins perspective, you have that provincial regulation that's layered on top as well. I think for us, what we would see, we work with both Bank Act entities and non-Bank Act, and we find that if you take a step back, initially, when you think about creating embedded insurance, you feel as though it could be a roadblock. But I would love to say that it's actually a conversation and a discovery. There is a way to do that. <laughs> but you do need to understand the constraints then, regulations that you're within, and understand your own risk tolerance and risk framework within your corporate strategy. And there are absolutely ways to go about it. I think you do see neobanks and challenger banks that have a lot more flexibility, of course, because they aren't so... Uh, stipulated to some of those regulations. They're leaning in a lot more untraditionally. But I think for us, it's been a, a really great opportunity to step back and understand what everyone's doing, and there is a path forward. Maybe I'll talk through a couple interesting examples in terms of what you're seeing in some of the, the larger institutions. We know that insurance is offered by almost all large financial institutions today. Um, but if you start to think companies like TD, TD, for anyone that has any loan product or product with TD, I'm sure you're going to see a multitude of emails. Uh, TD would love to offer you and typically does cross sell and offer you home and auto insurance and will happily tell you where inside the Bank Act they're doing that from. Um, but there are unique ways to start to target your customers. Um, Scotiabank, for example, offers a complimentary accidental death product that is $5,000 in coverage to you as complimentary value add. And within that, the ability is once that user takes that, they're actually moved over into a non-Scotiabank entity, and that entity can actually cross-sell insurance. You're seeing companies like RBC and many others that have those sub-entities, and within a sub-entity of the parent, they can actually cross-sell insurance as well. And so there's unique ways as a financial institution, but then you start to see non-traditional players, and one of our partners is actually TELUS. Um, they're really starting to enter this market as you're seeing utility companies as well. And how they're looking at this embedded insurance is for anyone that has the opportunity to have an app, and I think we even heard last night's dinner, uh, around what was your kind of fintech or most favorite app, of course, you mentioned the BMO app. Many apps have geolocation data on consumers. And so from a TELUS perspective, they know the moment any of their consumers set foot into an international airport or land at a destination. You're probably very familiar, whether it could be a different telco of receiving that roaming text message. And so inside that roaming text message that the consumer's already engaging with that partner on, um, they're actually embedding travel insurance as an offer. And that's actually Walnut there within that SMS. We've created a unique URL that's populated with that customer's information from TELUS. Of course, all the permissioning and the consent has already been done. And then at that consumer clicks on that link, it looks and feels like TELUS, and they can spend less than 30 seconds in secure travel insurance before they walk to their gate. And so you're starting to see these non-traditional areas lean into embedded a little bit more because they have more flexibility. But I would honor the fact that even for FIs, there's absolutely a way. It's just a different way you need to think about it. And we need to probably dive in to understanding the regulations more. But there is absolutely an opportunity to be thinking about how you embed insurance to create an additional product suite. 
Thank you. And Andrea, I would like to go back, uh, back to EQ Bank. How, how have you uh, lived the challenges of integrating with uh, new partners through uh, your applications? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's two, two elements to that. You know, first of all, how does, the, how does the partner react? I mean, certainly one of the things that was made us stand up wise really quickly was they had a great API dictionary, so, we, so our technical teams knew what they had to hit and speak to it. And that, in our experience, is actually unusual. So we, we get many fintechs approaching us saying, I've got this great API dictionary. You spend the first three months actually trying to figure out what it actually means. And so to the extent it's worth investing time if you're running a fintech to try and integrate with something like us, you know, having that super clean up front, and when, when, when our tech teams come and say, Andrew, these are great guys to work with, you can imagine the whole thing flows that much, that much more easily. I would say on the kind of general regulatory concern, uh, often it's around anti-money laundering, just to kind of take another tack. Um, and anti-money laundering, the intensity of the pressure on financial institutions, quite rightly, on anti-money laundering is very intense. And so if, again, if you're coming from the fintech world, uh, trying to sell to banks uh, as an embedded finance solution, Really make th sure you're being thoughtful about that anti-money laundering piece. Um, if it's something for us to solve, once you start talking to us, it's 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 going to be a big a big rock to push. Um, but if we get somebody coming to us thoughtful about what the risk model looks like, uh, for example, on Wise, if you're sending more than ten thousand dollars internationally, or receiving more than ten thousand dollars, all of a sudden we got higher reporting capabilities. It's actually really really critical what the exchange rate is being used at that time. And for example, so. Um, you know, we, you know it does, it, if it's $10,000 or one, it's different than $9,999, for example. So we, we need to be really thoughtful about where our constraints are. And, and again, a bit like our tech teams, if our tech teams are saying positive things about the API interface, if our regulatory teams are, are saying really positive things about, yeah, these guys get us, they understand us, they understand what, I mean, again, at the end of the day, it's our accountability. But if, if we're speaking the same language right off the hop, these embedded finance solutions become so much easier to, mm -hmm. to bring to life. And then we can be talking about the things we really want to talk to. This is how it's going to make the customer experience better. It's a great idea, you know, oh, I'm at the airport thinking, oh, I haven't got travel insurance. That's a big concern. If I can hit a button and resolve an issue, similarly within our, in our banking app, I've got to send $25 to my uh, sister in England to pay for my mother's birthday present. And I could do this as a, a t click of a button. Um, I, hopefully I'm more generous with my mother than that. But uh, you, know, you, you get the point that you, um, it's, it just makes it so much easier when now, now embedded in my life is my ability to send money to my family in, in England uh, so easily. Uh, that really changes the stress in my life and makes my life better through an embedded mm -hmm. finance solution. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot about the maturity of like the partnerships and, and the language that they are able to speak, which kind of relates to what we were speaking about, like education and and so far like the role that credit unions have been taking. So so maybe Mathieu, au niveau de de ça, de l'éducation offerte aux membres, quels sont quels sont les défis? Puis en considérant aussi, euh, il y a des, euh, la réglementation qui est aussi propre à chaque province, qui est différent. Uh, pour vous que, uh, que pour d'autres joueurs? Donc, euh, c'est sûr qu'il y, y a beaucoup de contraintes réglementaires. Pourquoi? Parce qu'on est dans un système financier canadien qui est très solide. Et on veut protéger le système financier canadien. On veut tous le protéger. Puis, moi, je me souviens de conférence de FinTech, là, il y a dix ans. Là, la discussion, c'était comment est-ce que les banques, les institutions financières vont, vont se faire damer le pion par les fintechs. Puis là, maintenant, on parle plus de comment on peut travailler ensemble pour, pour bâtir un, et continuer de bâtir un écosystème solide, un, un système, conserver la solidité du système bancaire canadien. Puis le système canadien est solide parce qu'il y a de la confiance des Canadiens. Et la confiance des Canadiens, elle vient avec le fait justement qu'on qu tient au sérieux les contextes réglementaires, qu'on qu porte une attention particulière à tous les éléments de sécurité, de money laundering que, que mon collègue parlait. Alors, on doit composer avec cet environnement-là et, euh, et c'est euh, souhaitable okay, de le faire. Euh, ce, ceci étant dit, la confiance, elle se bâtit beaucoup par le sentiment de sécurité. Euh, et euh, le sentiment de sécurité euh, dans un contexte de, 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 de régulateur. Il y a quelques principes, nous, euh, qu'on s'est donnés, puis je pense que toutes les institutions financières travaillent sur à peu près ces mêmes principes-là. Le premier, c'est que les requis de sécurité sont non négociables. Puis je dis vraiment non négociables, il y a un niveau de sécurité qui doit être atteint et ça peut surprendre des discussions qu'on a avec des fintechs ou des plus petits joueurs qui nous approchent. Nous, nous là, notre... Euh, 
notre cahier d'exigence de sécurité, il est épais comme ça. Okay? Donc, ça peut être un petit peu euh, déstabilisant, mais en même temps, il faut apprendre à travailler dans un environnement qui a des contraintes et ça requiert des fintech et des institutions financières de réussir à, à, se, à, à se comprendre dans, dans, dans ces requis-là de sécurité pour avancer. Uh, to make it in four months, <laughs> you really need to do it quickly, but understand the, the requirements on, on both sides. So I think this is where the, the challenge lies. Uh, et uh, donc, des requis de sécurité très importants, non négociables, premier principe. Puis le deuxième principe, and uh, you share, you, you talked um, uh, quickly about consent. This is also key. Uh, il faut aller chercher le consentement de nos utilisateurs, de nos membres, dans un contexte où l'écosystème est de plus en plus ouvert. On n'a pas beaucoup parlé d'open banking. Là. Je sais que ça, hier, ça a été un sujet qui a été traité. On travaille tous avec euh, l'industrie canadienne pour commencer à placer le cadre réglementaire de l'open banking. Et dans ce contexte-là, euh, pour moi, un des fondamentaux de l'open banking, ce sera d'aller chercher le consentement mais pas un consentement là, du genre un formule, tu sais, un, les fameux contrats de 18 pages, scroll down, là, où on, on scroll et on clique sans <rire> comprendre. On cherche, pour Desjardins, notre position, elle est très ferme aussi là-dessus. C'est un consentement éclairé. C'est le, le, le mot clé, là, éclairé. Et un consentement éclairé, ça veut dire que, premièrement, on a décidé d'être en opt-in pour un consentement. Donc, il euh, y a des institutions financières canadiennes qui choisissent le opt-out. Donc, par défaut, tu consens et tu dois aviser si tu ne veux pas consentir. Nous, on a pris une position qu'on va aller chercher le consentement en opt-in et de façon éclairée, ça veut dire avec un texte qui est compréhensible. On comprend à quoi je consens et on accepte comme organisation que tous nos membres ne consentent pas à partager mmh. la donnée. Et ça, c'est une stratégie qu'on qu s'est donnée et qu'on tient. On est une coopérative, on, on veut, on est au service de nos membres et euh, c'est dans notre mission euh, d'accompagner nos membres dans l'autonomie financière. Donc, ça a l'air euh, léger peut-être ce que je viens de dire là, mais ça a des conséquences importantes sur nos activités marketing. Mmh. Ça a des conséquences importantes sur notre capacité euh, d'aller euh, présenter des conseils à l'extérieur de, no de notre écosystème, mais c'est quelque chose pour lequel euh, nous, en tout cas, on est non négociable sur, euh, sur ça pour la suite. Thank you. And, uh, and both of you touched on anti-money laundering, which leads <laughs> us all like, to the payments. So, uh, uh, Hannah, what are the challenges with cross-border payments and, uh, and, and you in your role in expanding in North America? Uh, you, you must have like all these challenges in managing like the partnerships and different types of regulations as well. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I think we've heard a lot about what our partners are thinking about in terms of compliance and making sure that our requirements are good to go um, from day one. That's something that we've certainly focused on and I'm so glad that we've had happy experiences because of it. Uh, but in addition to understanding what our partners need, we're also thinking about how we're innovating within the regulations and within the payment schemes that exist in every market we work in, right? So the first challenge I'll speak to um, is certainly true in embedded finance and more broadly, I think, in the payment space, which is more around instant payments. We have made huge strides in many jurisdictions, and um, I would say that WISE is able to provide an amazing amount of instant payments. 50% of our payments last year globally were actually instant. But that's because we're doing a lot of work on the back end to connect to faster payments in the UK or PICS in Brazil. Uh, we are still limited by where we have lower adoption of instant rails. So for instance, in the US, FedNow, RTP, these rails are live, but we haven't seen as much uptake as we would like to. And then there are still some markets like Canada where we're excitedly awaiting RTR to launch. And we look forward to you know, bringing all of these domestic use cases together. The real challenge past that will be then standardizing the way that we have connectivity across these rails to create a truly instant international payment. There's been some exciting examples of this happening um, cross-border within APAC more regionally, uh, but still a long way to go and definitely a great opportunity. I think embedded finance is a great step in the right direction for that reason, because as you were saying, Jill, it's so important to meet a customer at their point of need and give them exactly what they need when they need it. Mm -hmm. um, so despite the fact that you know, we're not 100% instant yet, at least we're creating that more convenient experience for our partners and, and their customers. And the second challenge I'll speak about, oh, did you have Well, just, I mean, just, it's just 
bear, it, we can't really avoid that saying, really, the US stood up Fed now yeah. and we don't have real time rail in a country a tenth the size and less the complexity and fewer institutions. I mean, it's shame on all of us, frankly. And it's anyway, so we, we will get there. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we're waiting. I mean, it feels like being waiting for that bus to show up and it's, it's a, you know, the bus is never arriving and you can't even see it coming down the street. And it's, yeah. it's a bit depressing. So anybody who's got any influence on moving real time rails forward or moving open banking forward, please let's all lean in because we, we, need, to get, we need to get that in order to bring some of these uh, features to life that can then make you know, people in Canada's lives better. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I would also say that that's part of the power of embedded finance. Like we as institutions can't move the needle on these topics individually. It takes the industry to change the industry. So I'm super excited to see um, these partnerships continue to expand because that's how we make meaningful and effective change. And we have adoption of these types of innovations in each market. Uh, the last thing I want to quickly touch on, because we talked a little bit about consent, yeah. um, and when we're thinking about feeling confident in solutions that partners are integrating in cross-border specifically, uh, price transparency is really, really important. Consumers and small businesses want to be confident that when they send a payment, the same amount that they send will be what actually arrives to the recipient. Um, and that's a huge decision-making for them as they're choosing a provider. And for small business customers particularly, this is important because a guaranteed delivery is really crucial to their everyday business operations. And uh, again, I'm excited to see more transparency across the market, especially through these partnerships. And that's, that's an area as well, actually, FX, mm -hmm. uh, FX and international money remittances is an area where you hear advertising saying no fees, but the, the exchange rate's not a great exchange rate. Um, yeah. So the opacity and the, in my mind, lack of clarity to, and the, we're talking, we're talking about retail consumers, not people that are looking at the road Reuters mid-market rate right now and comparing the rate. And I think we can bring more transparency with embedded finance solutions as to what's the real cost. So I mean, when, when, we, when somebody puts money on why a wise rail from our EQ bank account, you know you got the mid-market rate and you know that you paid five bucks or whatever it is. So it's, it's completely transparent. And that brings an innovation to the market. Frankly, we've found it difficult to, to really explain that challenge even to a financial journalist who, who you would think would be pretty sophisticated about that. But there's, there's a, you know, a real customer benefit by having bring some of these embedded finance solutions to, to life in terms of what are you really paying for this, this product? Yeah. It, do you want my job, Andrew? I think you're, you're doing a great job here. <laughs> I'm loving it. Well, actually, I would. New York sounds good. <laughs> awesome. So uh, why don't we get into like, what you see as like trends? Uh, going forward. Uh, so we've uh, spoken about the challenges, uh, regulatory, I'm sure there's like the technical challenges as well that you have all uh, been um, going through and that there are best practices uh, that, that are and maturity of like the partners that you work with that enable uh, this faster integrations. But uh, so we're, we're seeing that this is maybe not just a trend, you know, I'm saying what are the future trends, but maybe this is not a trend. It's here now. And we're seeing that disruption is just happening constantly. It was said yesterday in 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 some of the uh, conferences. It's uh, it's just the the business as usual. And so how do you see the next 10 years uh, for embedded finance and embedded insurance? So um, maybe, uh, Mathieu, uh, for uh, undeserved populations or the reach out in Canada, maybe for like new immigrants coming into the country, how do you see the trends and, and the, the ability to uh, provide, uh, continue to provide experiences uh, to, to uh, the new population? Yeah. Euh, J'ai le bonheur de travailler chez Desjardins depuis 25 ans. Je commence à être un vieux jeune. Je me considère jeune encore, mais de plus en plus vieux. Et j'ai vu les transitions des de les deux dernières décennies. Puis, puis j'ai passé personnellement avec nos équipes une bonne partie de ma carrière à accompagner une organisation qui était dans une transition digitale, une transformation numérique, où on a essentiellement pris des transactions puis des opérations au comptoir, dans les guichets automatiques, on a amené ça en ligne euh, et en ligne web, et là maintenant sur le mobile. Et euh, ça, c'était pas mal le début du, euh, des, des années 2000. Et dans les années 2010, on avait fait un bon boulot sur les transactions plus simples. Puis là, depuis euh, les dernières années, on a beaucoup amené l'acquisition de produits en ligne. Donc, euh, être capable d'aller euh, 
chercher un financement en ligne, un prêt, euh, obtenir une carte de crédit, euh, aller chercher de l'épargne. Donc, euh, vraiment la dynamique de, ou des assurances, donc une soumission d'assurance. Donc, on a beaucoup investi de nos, de, nos, de nos efforts pour amener et les transactions et l'achat de produits en ligne. Ça, c'est, je résume 20 ans okay, de travail qu'on, qu'on a fait. Pour moi, les 10 prochaines années, c'est ce qui s'en vient devant nous, c'est ce qui est le plus difficile. Là, on a fait le « easy stuff ». <rire> Ce qui s'en vient, c'est le virage du conseil et euh, du conseil financier en ligne pour justement accompagner des clientèles qui ont une littératie financière plus faible, accompagner des nouveaux arrivants qui ne connaissent pas le milieu financier canadien. Dans certains pays, le, même le concept de, 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 de prêt n'existe pas. Donc, il faut vraiment passer du temps pour accompagner la clientèle et le, amener du conseil en ligne avec, à l'ère de l'intelligence artificielle, évidemment, c'est très challengeant pour les organisations. On a souvent dans les institutions financières associé le conseil à un humain. Donc, euh, si, si vous voulez faire des choses simples, allez en ligne. Si vous voulez du conseil, parlez à quelqu'un. Dans les dix prochaines années, le conseil s'en vient en ligne. Euh, alors, il faut se préparer à ça. Il faut développer la technologie, préparer nos, euh, nos employés, préparer aussi nos membres à avoir de plus en plus de conseils en ligne. Puis, c'est un super timing euh, que je sois ici aujourd'hui parce qu'on est en train de lancer notre nouvelle assistante virtuelle pour les membres des jardins. Vous l'avez peut-être vu, on a commencé à en parler sur l'application mobile. Elle s'en vient dans quelques semaines à peine. Une conseillère, une assistante virtuelle, une conseillère qui va vous donner des astuces financières sur vos transactions quotidiennes et qu'on va faire grandir avec le temps pour devenir finalement, en quelque sorte, une conseillère financière chez Desjardins quand on interagit sur les canaux, les, nos, nos canaux plus autonomes, donc les services en, mobiles ou les services en ligne. Alors, c'est un, c'est un bon virage qui se prend. On fait ça accompagné notamment d'organisations externes. On est accompagné de, euh, de, 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 d'une FinTech là, qui, euh, qui, qui nous déploie ce système-là avec nous pour nous accélérer dans notre changement. Donc, quand je parlais tantôt de, de partenariat, ça ne fait que s'amplifier ce qu'on doit faire pour aller de l'avant. Euh, et, euh, mais ça vient challenger profondément notre façon de voir notre propre organisation puis de penser le service à l'ère du numérique euh, dans un contexte de, 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 d'attente des consommateurs qui sont de plus en plus très clairs sur le fait qu'ils veulent être de plus en plus autonomes. Yes, thank you. So, uh, for embedded insurance, this notion of like giving advice, uh, everything online and uh, and accompanying the customer uh, like throughout, like what do you see are the trends that that uh, that will uh, continue to emerge in uh, embedded insurance, Jill? I think what we've been talking about, and I think what Mathieu was just mentioning, the consumer is expecting that you are meeting them where they are. You're embedding everything at that moment of time, payments, everything. They, are, they want that with presented to them either combined or in an easy to use fashion that it doesn't feel like they need to self-source. Uh, for us, if I think of 10 years in insurance, I really do believe these are going to be some of the most disruptive changes in insurance. We know that it's, of course, a lagger behind the fintech space, but I would say embedded insurance concept isn't the future, it's here. I think for us, we're demonstrating that with so many partners, and what we're actually finding is many are lagging in that in terms of still offering insurance on a 1-800 number um, for travel insurance or creditor, or it's a paper-based ancillary product that is an add-on after. And you're seeing such a drastic changes in attachment rates by going digital and creating embedded. So for me, I'd say embedded is here. It's just you need to get on that train. Um, But where you're going to start to see changes in insurance is what we'll call embedded inside. How is insurance actually being used as a value proposition to financial products? You're seeing this in the U.S. right now. When you think about debt protection or creditor, um, companies like Avon partnered with Securion or Happy Money with TrueStage are actually embedding that debt protection or creditor inside of the loan. It's an automatic inclusion. I recognize that's different regulatory conditions than we have here in Canada, but they're embedding that as a differentiator to seek that loan from them. And so you're starting to see that integration and we'll call embedded inside or protection-based products that are a little bit more coverage at times can be considered insurance, at times cannot based on 
which province you're in, um, but you're starting to see personal cyber protection or 24-7 um, legal support or emotional assistance tied to travel insurance as a differentiator in case an event happens, or you're using those as means to get somebody over the fence in terms of a regulatory angle. So I'd say those are, those are pieces where that embedded inside and in how insurance or protection is being used as either a mechanism um, to or differentiator is an interesting piece. But I think you'll start to see, and we've already seen it, OEMs like Tesla cre underwriting their own insurance product, offering that as an embedded opportunity inside of your purchase. You're going to continue to see operators do that predominantly, and I think even in the auto industry, as we move towards autonomous vehicles, that's going to be a massive disruption to auto. I can assume that we're going to start to see either you moment you use or rent an autonomous vehicle, insurance is included, or there's some sort of embedded nature there that changes it from being a personal product to more a product against the use. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say, of course, Gen AI and all of those pieces in RPA and the use of how you leverage that technology to create that personal pricing, the direct personal underwriting, change in anti money laundering or fraud detection and all those pieces that I know are being done within the insurance organizations, but you're going to continue to see way more fintech start to play there. And I think one piece, and Andrew touched on this in terms of the API connectivity, and I think that was an important piece for both WISE and EQ, what we're starting to see since we leave with APIs is we'll work with our partners and distribution partners on the API elements, but we find on the carrier side, you're very, there's a leg there absolutely and I think that there's that API connectivity is so critically important in the insurance sector to start to take advantage of partnerships and unique opportunities and set up the infrastructure so data can be passed in that way um, I think that that's one of probably the biggest things we're going to see is how technology is being used and how are insure techs trying to kind of disrupt the insurance space to help them move forward or almost help our own selves to move forward in that way and I, I love your point of being there w where the client is. And I think this is key for, for us, or Mobile App for banking. We have 1.6 million users every day that mm -hmm. are logging in. Every day. It's crazy. So how can we present a more integrated offer Absolutely. to those people that are already visiting our, our Mobile App? Some companies would kill to get that traffic. <laughs> we have it naturally. So how can we, as you mentioned, integrate and maybe uh, go with like multiple offers for for your customers. I hope next year, Matthew and I can say and be able to share with you how we did it, how we can integrate <laughs> insurance inside of the app and get Literally. through all the regulatory conditions and show. But I think there are ways, and it, yeah. the consumer is expecting any payment. They're expecting to be able to understand balances. They're expecting to be able to source insurance. They're ex there's everything they're expecting to have at that moment. Mm -hmm. They're no longer going and seeking it out. I think that's been the biggest thing. Well, I, th I think as well, I mean, so the territory we think is, is going to reach out. But by the way, we only think we're in the kind of first or second innings of a nine inning game on embedded finance. Uh, but the, for many, peop many families, the way we think about this is there's really the family CFO. It, it turns out when you do the research, it turns out in, in any family, there seems to be one person that unwillingly is bearing the burden of looking after the family finances. So many of the things we're talking about here are transactional. So our, our, our thing with WISE is Primarily transactional, you're making a payment, it's sort of done and dusted once that transaction's done. And I think the future of embedded finance and open banking is really that the transactional piece is really important to be where you are today and be able to do something conveniently. The, your, your example of getting travel insurance because you're leaving right now. But also though thinking more broadly about advice and wealth and how can, I re how can this family you know, put their kids through school or, 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 or those kinds of things. And those things I, I haven't yet seen mature to the point where mm. a digital experience takes us there. Yeah. But I do think that that's the possibility, that's the future potentially of many of these embedded finance, finance solutions. You know, both make the transaction easy in the point of time, but also that time where you're actually thinking about things in a much longer time period. And if you're the family CFO, you'd like to be able to communicate with the rest of the family that you're doing the right thing for the, for the team, as mm. it were. And I, th I think that's a, a, an interesting area, an interesting territory for many fintechs to be exploring. Hannah, how does the outlook for embedded, in, uh, embedded finance and then for WISE cross-border payments look? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the next 10 years? Yeah, I think it really varies across different regions, right? Um, Andrew kind of spoke to this, but North America is behind. 
Um, APAC has always been a leader in embedded finance and payments innovation overall. You can see that with examples like uptake of pay by QR code mm -hmm. or instant payments. Um, the consumer mindset there is much more open to a financial experience like from a non-financial brand. And that has allowed a lot more innovation. We're also seeing exciting things um, in Latin America with PIX in Brazil, amazing uptake of that instant rail. Um, but in North America, we still have a lot of ways to go. And that's, of course, like on the regulatory side, as we were speaking about, um, on the payment rail side, but also for what consumers expect. So mm -hmm. they are getting more and more used to these experiences in you know, maybe a non-financial flow, um, and then pleasantly surprised when they have the ease that they need and expect to get insurance or to make a payment. Um, but I'm excited to see continued adoption of that here in America, <laughs> uh, well, in North America overall. But I think Canada is really interesting because you are leading the way versus your US neighbors in terms of access for non-traditional players to these payment rails, right? We're seeing changes in the RPAA, which we're really excited about at WISE. Um, and in the US, which is such a huge market, doing ins and outs, certainly, you know, we're sending a lot of money to and from Canada. Uh, but there, there's not a clear path for a fintech to directly connect to the payment rails themselves mm -hmm. or to the central bank. And that makes payments slower and more expensive across the board. So really excited for what's going to happen here in the next 10 years. That is great. That is great. So I, I would like to thank you all for uh, sharing these insights. Uh, I don't think we have uh, that much time for a Q&A uh, portion, but I would invite anybody that has a specific questions to approach any of the panelists right after uh, this uh, session and uh, just ask your questions and don't hesitate. Um, so we covered a broad uh, range of perspectives, embedded finance, embedded insurance, embedded experiences, what it means in terms of uh, regulatory uh, challenges in integrating like all the new technologies and, and using them to uh, integrate faster and have uh, speed to market uh, reduced. Uh, so this is all, uh, you know, very, very exciting, a lot of uh, work ahead. And uh, I think that uh, the audience may benefit from some of the use cases that like, were shared today. And I do hope that there is a partnership that is made with like, some of the players <laughs> and that we get to help as well. So, <laughs> so on that, I would like to thank everyone for being here. And I thank our panelists for the time mm -hmm. and your insights and expertise that you provided today. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.